Welcome to Developing Graphics Frameworks with Python and OpenGL, Part 23, Framework Class Structure Overview. Well, we've done a lot of coding, and now it's time to start putting together the overarching graphics framework. To automate some of the tasks which we've seen that we have to do in every application up to this point. At the heart of any graphics framework is something called a scene graph. It's a data structure that's used to organize the contents of a 3D scene using some kind of hierarchical or tree-like structure. In the context of computer science, a tree is a data structure that's a collection of node-like objects. So here we have a diagram of a tree structure with seven nodes. Each node is an object which stores some kind of a value or some other object. It also contains a list of child nodes and for convenience, let's say it contains a reference to the parent. So for example, here at the top, we have node A which has three child nodes, B, C, and D. Each of these child nodes has A as its parent. Uh, B has two child nodes, E and F. C has no child nodes. And D has one child node, node G. Every node has a parent, except for node A. And that's a special kind of node called the root node, the root of the tree. But the way we typically draw trees in computer science, unlike trees in nature, we usually draw the root of the tree at the top. Every node has a set of descendants. So for example, the descendants of the root consist of all the nodes on the tree. Each descendant can be reached from a node by some chain of child nodes. So for example, E is a descendant of A because I can get from A to E through a sequence of child nodes, from A to B to E. Uh, in the reverse order, we have ancestors of a node. For example, the ancestors of F are B and A. The ancestor of D is just A. And so that's some of the terminology we'll use when we're talking about the nodes of a tree or the objects in a scene graph. Now, scene graphs are really useful for a few reasons. Uh, scene graphs can be used to store all the different objects kind of relative to each other. As we've discussed in a previous video, each object to store its position and orientation and its scale we store that information as a set of accumulated transformations in a single matrix called the model matrix. Now, each object in our scene will have a model matrix, and that will actually store its position and orientation relative to its parent, rather than relative to the root of the scene. The world transformation will be the position and orientation of the object relative to the root of the scene. And that's pretty straightforward to calculate. To find the world transformation, you just have to calculate the product of the transformation matrix of each object with each of its ancestors. So going back to this example of a possible scene graph, uh, B will have some kind of a model matrix, and that stores its position relative to A, the scene or the root. E will store its position relative to B. If I want the position of E relative to A, I would multiply the model matrix of E times the model matrix of B. And that would give me the world transformation of E. So there's a few reasons that it's really useful to use a tree-like structure. Uh, one example is it really simplifies relative motion of objects. For example, consider the motion of the moon relative to the sun in our solar system. So the moon of Earth relative to our sun. That kind of follows a, a very loopy pattern 
it would be really difficult to come up with the equation of this particular curve. However, we can more easily describe the motion of the moon relative to the Earth. The moon circles the Earth, while the Earth circles the Sun. And so we can take a complicated motion and write it as a product of transformations of two simple motions. Also, transformations are useful uh, without reference to the scene graph. They're useful because they allow you to reuse objects in a scene. So for example here, I have a very basic table. It's basically created from five box-like shapes, a long thin one, or a long flat one for the top, and three tall skinny ones for the legs. Really that's just the same geometric object with four different transformation objects applied. So transformation or model matrices help us efficiently reuse our data. But also the scene graph structure lets us think of this table as a complete unit. We might have one node in our scene graph tree which represents the table and that consists of five child nodes one for each of these boxes. I could then apply a transformation to a parent node and that carries through and moves all the child nodes. So the scene graph structure allows us to group together simple geometric objects into more complex holes. Now in terms of classes, the most basic class we're going to have in our structure we'll call Object 3D. That's going to represent the nodes in our scene graph, or equivalently, the different kinds of objects we have in our world. And Object 3D will store three main pieces of information. A matrix to store its local transformation, again local to its parent, relative to its parent. It will store a list of references to the child objects. That list could be empty if there are no child objects and it will store a reference to its parent object, or in the case of the root, there will be no parent object. The first thing we'll do is we'll take this class and we'll extend it into a variety of classes. For example, the root node is very special, and we'll actually call that a scene object. Uh, those interior nodes, which we use to group together simpler objects, for example, grouping together the parts of a table, we'll represent that with uh, something called a group class and just a simple extension of object 3D. Those visible objects in the scene, we're going to use something called a mesh class, which we'll talk about a little bit more in detail on the next slide. But a mesh will be something we can actually see and render on the screen. There will be a camera class, which is not something we see within the scene, but it controls the position and orientation of the viewer, so it will affect the final rendered image. And finally, uh, we won't do this one for a while, but we'll need a light class. Again, that occupies usually a position within the scene, and depending on the type of light that it is, its orientation could also be important. It will affect the way objects look, they will affect shading and shadows of objects in our scene. And again, we can think of it as occupying an actual place, even if technically the light itself doesn't render. So that's our main class. The mesh class is going to be very important. And again, we want to make this class reusable. So the mesh class is going to store a few different things. It's going to store the transformation matrix, since it's an object 3D. It's also going to store instances of two other classes, one called Geometry and one called Material. The Geometry class, we'll use that to specify the general shape of an object. You know, is it a box? Is it a sphere? Is it a cylinder? So it'll store the locations of the points and other vertex-related properties. And these we store with attribute objects as we've seen in previous examples. So geometries specify the overall shape. Materials, those will specify the general appearance of an object. 
Now, should it be kind of an overall brown object? Um, should it render as a solid or a set of lines or even a set of points? And the material class will store a few pieces of information. It'll store the code for the shaders used to render an object. It'll store any uniforms which are defined by the shaders, with a few exceptions. We'll talk about those later. And also store the overall render settings. And these are things like in the GL draw arrays function, uh, are you rendering something as points or lines or triangles? If you're rendering it as points, what's the point size? If you're rendering as lines, what's the line width? So that's what I'm grouping into this term of render settings. And finally, I didn't forget about this point, the mesh class will store vertex array object. The mesh class feels like a natural place to store this piece of information because it connects these two other classes, the geometry class and the material class. Uh, if the geometry class stores attributes, right, that uh, includes references to vertex buffers, those need to be associated to different variables in the shaders, which we're going to store in a material class. So since we need to connect those two pieces of information uh, with a vertex object, that'll be stored at the mesh class level. Finally, the last thing we're going to need, at least for now, is a general renderer class. This is going to handle all the overall OpenGL initialization tasks, and it's going to handle the rendering of the image. Uh, this will happen with a function called render, and as parameters, that's going to need a scene object, which contains the scene graph and all the mesh objects. It'll also require a camera. Now for every mesh within this scene, it needs to do a bunch of things before it can call the GL draw arrays function. As we've seen, every time we need to write an application, every time we want to render something, we need to activate a shader program. We need to bind a vertex array object. We need to configure set up the OpenGL render settings, and we need to send the values stored in our uniform objects to the associated uniform variables in the shader program. So the mesh class will store a lot of this information, but the renderer will use that information. It'll do a few other things as well. Uh, for example, there are a few uniform variables which each mesh will need that are stored outside the mesh. In particular, I'm thinking of the model matrix, right? That's stored at the mesh level, not within the material object, but the renderer will take care of that detail. Or the projection matrix. We haven't discussed where we're going to store the perspective projection matrix. But again, the renderer will handle setting those values and the corresponding uniform variables. All right, so that's, uh, that's going to be our basic first pass at our overall graphics framework. In the next video, we'll start to implement these different classes, and we'll start off with the Object 3D class. Thanks for watching.